Rub up your engines! One of your viewers wrote in, his name is Chris H, and he's leasing a Toyota, and he's thinking about buying it at the end of the lease, right? But they want to charge him a $400 inspection fee before he buys the vehicle, which he's been leasing, right? Talk about absurdity. Listen to this. Scotty, I have a lease buyout option on my 2020 Toyota Camry. The dealer's trying to take a $400 fee from me, saying it's a vehicle inspection to be certified before I buy the car. Keep in mind, I've had it for three years in December. I called Toyota Financial, and they said I don't have to pay this fee. I called the lender who's trying to refinance the loan through, and they said, said, you have to get it from the dealer. The dealer will not release the document for my car unless I pay this fee. It's a scam and it's not my contract. Help me, please. What a bunch of scumbags. The dealership just wants to make 400 bucks. Now, their thing is, well, we can't sell you the car until it's certified, right? Certified. The guy's driven it for three years because he leased it from new, right? Just a scam so the dealer can make 400 bucks. Talk about absurdity. Toyota Financial said, hey, you don't have to pay this fee, but the dealer won't give him the paperwork unless he pays the fee. What a scumbag. The guy's been leasing the car and he said, oh, I'm going to buy it. Well, you got to pay us 400 boxes we have to certify it <laughs> <laughs> He's been driving it for three years. He knows, right? It just shows you the length that these sleazy car dealerships will do. In this case, it was a Toyota dealership. But understand one thing. Toyota Financial said he didn't have to pay the fee, right? That's the company. But the dealership won't give the paperwork unless they get the $400 because the dealerships are independently owned by very sleazy people often who want to get money out of you any way they possibly can. So if I were you, I would contact Toyota itself the company in Japan. And believe me, they'll make you not pay the $400 because they care. The dealerships, they don't give a crap. They're just American scumbags wanting to make money off of you any way they possibly can. But the Toyota Motor Company does. As they said, you don't have to pay this fee. The guy won't give you the paperwork, right? Toyota can kind of force him to do it, I'm sure. They could say, well, you're going to lose your license to be able to sell Toyotas if you don't stop this crap, right? But you need to go to Toyota for that one. But maybe this video will help. Show them this video. <laughs> George 027. Says, is it bad to idle at 2,000 RPM to warm up faster? I drive an old vehicle, not that old since it's fuel injector, and I use modern synthetic oil. Would it be better if I rev it up at 2,000 RPM so it warms up faster? No, that's a bad idea. You don't want to rev up an engine when you start it up. Just, it's fuel injected, it starts up fine. If you're worried, let it sit for four or five minutes and warm up itself while idling. You don't want to rev up a cold engine. It doesn't matter what kind of oil you have in it. Let it warm up a little by itself. Don't rev it up. Now, normally you don't have to warm up an engine at all, it's fuel injected, unless it's really cold outside, but of course people want to get warm, so you might want to start the car up, turn the heater on, walk away, have a cup of coffee and come back and then drive the thing, and then you'll have a little more heat inside the car, so you won't have freezing breath inside your car as well as outside your car, but don't rev it up. That's not a smart thing to do. The fuel injected cars are set up to warm themselves up correctly by computers. You screw it up if you rev it up, and you don't want to rev up a cold engine anyway. That's about the worst thing you can do to a cold engine. GSX RDRE says I have a 2008 Infinity. After it sits 10 to 15 minutes, it knocks. I got an 08 Infinity. I put 93 octane from shot, runs fine. But if I drive it 10 miles or more and I stop and shut it off for 5 10 minutes, it knocks when I start it up and then it stops. I got new plugs filter, clean the mass sensor and throttle body. No code. What could it be? All right, well, 99% of the time, that's going to be you've got some type of fuel flooding your engine up. If your fuel injectors slightly leak, when you're driving around, it's fine, but when you shut the car off, 5 to 10, 15 minutes, if the injectors, some of them are leaking, or all of them, they drip fuel, it floods the engine out. So when you start the engine up, there's too much gas and it knocks because there's raw gas going in. It's making it knock and clatter because it doesn't fire correctly. But then, like you say, as soon as you rev it up and start going, it stops knocking. If I were you, the first thing I'd do is have the fuel injectors cleaned because maybe they're just dirty and they're dripping and that will fix. Fuel injectors themselves cost an awful lot of money. You did the office. You changed the spark plugs, PCV valve, sensors, clean stuff. Yeah. But if your fuel injection system is leaking and it's dripping extra gas, that's exactly what it'll do because it's 
Dripping it in. So try cleaning them first. If you like my friend Bernie's cleaner, the ATS, it's a great fuel cleaner. You pour in a gas tank, it cleans it as you drive, stops all kinds of problems. And if it was leaking because there's carbon on there and then the carbon blocks it's the injector pindles and then they dribble a little, it'll clean them. This stuff's phenomenal. Could be as simple as pouring that stuff in, driving it for a couple of days, and away it goes. Devin878, how do you clean engine oil sludge out of an air intake? I got no six Corolla I bought used and when I took off the top of the valve cover I saw there was sludge everywhere inside the plastic manifold and on the tops of the valves. I dug online I thought it was a failed PCV so I changed it but there's gunk everywhere how can I clean it out? Sludge is sludge, it's oil based sludge right? So what you want to do get some good spray cleaner and what you would want would be the spray cleaner that's good for cleaning the throttles because the throttles pass there right? It won't hurt plastic and just clean the heck out of the thing. Now if you're not taking the engine apart, the engine's just sitting there, you're not tearing it apart, you'd spray a bunch of it in and that will loosen the sludge. Then get yourself any kind of suction device. If you got a vacuum hose, use a shop vac and what you can do like I do, you can get the shop vac and then you can get small hoses and duct tape them to the end of the hose on the shop vac. So you got a small intake hose coming in and the duct tape holds it to the vacuum and reach in and then you can suck all the crud out once it's been loosened up with the cleaner. That's the best way to do it. It won't hurt anything. Whatever the hole size is, just get a hose that small. Get in any auto parts store. They sell like a uh, vacuum line that's real small and then duct tape it to the end of your nozzle on a shop vac or any kind of vacuum you got. Then when you stick it in, it'll suck through the small hole and you can put it wherever you want. Works quite well. Jerry Monk says, can I fix squeaky suspension with grease? I got an 06 Chrysler TNC. Can I grease front end suspension, what type of grease can I use? All right, here's the problem. When I was a young mechanic in the 60s, all cars had greasable joints. They had a fitting, they're called Zerk fittings. I guess it's some guy's name. They called them Zerk fittings. You put a grease gun on the Zerk fitting, you'd pump it, the grease would go inside and it would lubricate it. Those are all sealed now, you can't do that. So the only thing that you can grease is, let's say your sway bar bushings are creaking. You would have to take the sway bar off, take the rubber bushings off, grease the metal bar, put the bushings back on and put it back together. So you're really not going to take your whole car apart for that. I found a phenomenal thing years ago. It's called AT205 Reseal. It's made by a company in Chicago called ATP Automatic Transmission Products. It's a clear liquid. It's a polymer. And what you do is you pour it in a spray bottle and you spray all the rubber bushings and let it soak overnight. It will rejuvenate the rubber as it soaks in. You don't spray and drive. You soak and let it sit overnight and then it soaks in after you spray it all out. And it can get rid of all kinds of creaks. It'll get on the rubber, rejuvenates the rubber so it doesn't creak. On most modern cars, it's rubber creaking and you'll hear it more in the winter than the summer because when it's cold, you know, guess what? The rubber's colder and harder, it's going to creak more and when it's warm, it doesn't creak as much. So AT205 Resol. Now, if you can't find that, you can try WD-40, which will last a little, but WD-40, the water will wash it off, where the AT205 Reseal is different. It's a polymer and it will just bind right into the rubber and it will stay there. JJ Roman says, is it harmful to drive in eco mode? I got a 2021 RAV4 Prime. That doesn't hurt anything. Eco mode just makes your car get the most efficient gas mileage. So you have a little bit less acceleration and it shifts into the higher gears quicker. Let's say back in the olden days when everybody had manual transmissions. If you take off, the fastest you would get into top gear, which back in the day was only three gears, you got into third gear, that's the gear you get the best gas mileage. So the quicker you get to third gear, the better gas mileage you're going to get. Well, your vehicle is basically doing the same thing, but unlike the old fashioned one, yours is all run by computers. The computers adjust everything. It doesn't hurt anything at all. You can drive it forever that way if you want. It won't hurt anything. You just get better gas mileage. And on the other hand, people that want to drive fast, they'll put it in sport mode and you will accelerate fast. Well, of course, that will wear your vehicle out somewhat faster. It'll stay in the lower gears longer. The transmission will spin faster. The engine revs higher. So it will wear out somewhat faster. If anything, if you stay in eco mode, the car will last longer. Oaken Cho says, which luxury German car should I buy? I'm from New York City. I drive a... 2019 Mazda CX-5 Signature, I want a new luxury vehicle like a Mercedes E450 or Porsche 17 or a BMW M440. This new car will not be a daily driver. If you had to choose, what would be your most reliable for a guy going 1,200 miles a year? Well, I wouldn't buy any German luxury car. They're overpriced, but you live in New York and it's your toy car. It's not an everyday driver, so you probably have lots of money. So what the heck? It's your money. Do whatever you want with it. Out of those choices, the Mercedes, because the Porsches are endless money pits. Their resale value drops like a stone. 
Bridgestone. And the BMWs are so high tech that they are one of the most expensive cars to maintain. The Mercedes aren't cheap, but if you're only going to be driving 1,200 miles and you're going to buy a new one, it's going to be a while before the thing should fall apart. Even, you know, the Mercedes aren't that poorly made, you know. The only thing I have to say is don't buy one made in Alabama like a guy did last year brought me one. He said it was the biggest pile of crap he ever had. He bought one from Alabama. He paid 140 something grand. It was a piece of crap, right? Get one made in Germany. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.